Yeah, and one of the last things I watched, people shaking their heads. What are you doing here? So um, it was an interview with Alice Cooper about Glenn Campbell, just shortly after he died, after Glenn Campbell died. Glenn Campbell, you know, you don't know, was one of the greatest guitar players in the world. He was a phenomenal guitar player. And, um, you know, as when I talked about the Wrecking Crew months ago, um, he was in that. These are the greatest musicians in L.A., and everybody wanted them to be their backup crew. Well, reminded me of, of uh, is it Larry Gatlin? Is it? Uh, both these guys were cocaine addicts. Uh, Glenn Campbell, uh, really bad. Alice Cooper, really bad. They were in different kinds of uh, rock music. You know, Glenn Campbell was kind of this this clean kind of, and Alice Cooper was like way off. You know, they were well. They went through this period in their lives in the probably the seventies, eighties, where they were just crazy into drugs, and but still immensely popular. Eventually, both of them moved out of L.A. to get away from that scene. They both moved to Arizona. They became very, very close friends. Both played golf. <laughs> and big, really good golfers. So they played a couple times a week. So here's Alice Cooper. I didn't know any of this. And I'm, One o'clock in the morning, I found out. Um, but he was saying... He was, he, was, he was just convinced. He said, you know, we're both Christians now, and I know where Glenn is. He's in heaven. I have no doubt about that. It was such a strange thing to be watching at 1 o'clock this morning. But I, I saw this little thing, you know, Alice Cooper talking about Glenn Campbell. I wonder, you know, did they both play the guitar or something? And they were close friends and Christians. And Christians. But it reminded me so much of this, because they had everything, right, that, as far as we knew, right, as far as we knew. Okay, our title t today is Worried. Worried? Anybody here worried about anything? Can I see just hands of, of any, there's a lot of liars here. <laughs> A lot of embarrassed people. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 you know, I thought about that. How many people here thought about winning the lottery? About the, you know, what you would do with a billion dollars? It would so change your life, and not for the good. You know, you think of all the good you would do, and then you just keep fifty million for yourself or 100, or 200, well, you know, 300, how far does that go, right? Uh, or 400, you know, you just get consumed, absolutely consumed with that. And people who actually are billionaires, they don't function, the money is almost beside the point of their lives. They're, they're, it's just like accumulating stuff for them. They have a life. They just have all this money trailing behind them. But they have all the same issues that we have. They just have more issues. And you want those? We think we do. It's kind of like looking at Glenn Campbell and Alice Cooper. and learn, Oh, wow, what a great life. Maybe. See ya. So, so, I exhort the elders among you. This is First Peter chapter 5. And there's so much in this passage that I'm not going to preach. I'm just preaching the end of the passage. This little phrase at the end. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, 
exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Because he cares for you. Think of different ways to read that sentence. It gives it different meaning. But it's probably all true, however you read it. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. It's defined uh, anxiety uh, as a painful or apprehensive uneasiness of mind, usually over an anticipated or impending situation, or a strong, fearful concern. Anticipating. There was some research done on, on, on worry, and this research, um, and I'm always a little dubious about research, because I'm just, you know. But anyway, this research, said that 40% of, of the things we worry about never happen. 40% never happen. I think, you know, if you're worried you might win that billion dollars, that, that'd be 100%. <laughs> bank on that. 30% uh, uh, with things we worry on things that have happened in the past and can't be changed. Okay, that's 70%. 12% on criticism from other people, and it usually isn't even true. Okay, so that's 82%. 8% on real problems that we will have to be facing. So 8%. So 8%, and then the other 10%, didn't show, so I, I don't know what that other 10% was, but you add up those percentages, they don't add up to 100. So let's just say 18% of the things you worry about are things that could happen, or they're going to happen. You know, 18%. So 82% of the time you spent worrying is just lost. It's just wasted. Time you could be doing something else, Time you could be encouraged rather than discouraged. Oh well. On the other hand, uh, a little bit of anxiety isn't a bad thing. In verse 8, which isn't what part of our passage, um, Peter tells us to be on the alert for the devil's tricks. This roaring lion that Peter talked. It's not supposed to be just dismissed. It's a real thing. So watch out. So there, there's a little anxiety around that. That's, that's fine. It's fine to have that kind of caution. Um, God gave us anxiety and fear uh, for our own protection. You know, in, a, in a fallen world, we're surrounded by bad stuff. I, I, <laughs> these witches, you know, putting hexes or whatever they're doing on Kavanaugh. They're crazy stuff. But they're serious. They're serious. We have a lot of serious minded people who want evil to happen. That's a frightening world. So there, there are things to be cautious about. How many people each year die because they didn't take proper precautions when taking selfies? Yeah, people step off a cliff. 
Oh, you know, the water doesn't seem close enough. Well, now it is. <laughs> wow. But we need to have a positive approach toward worry, toward anxiety, and a spiritual approach. And that's, that's what our passage is about. Cast all your anxiety on him. Casting all your anxieties on him, for he cares for you. Um, a lot of people cope with life's fears with self-reliance. Um, but even though the Lord gives us spiritual gifts and, and leadership qualities and problem-solving uh, abilities, critical thinking techniques, all of this, Christians need uh, to balance that with a healthy reliance on the Lord. So if we, um, thing is, if, if we don't acknowledge the Lord's work, whether we think we're doing it or, uh, or it gets solved somehow miraculously, we tend to take credit ourselves. We tend to take credit for things the Lord does. So when we let him have it, it's out of our hands. So, casting... Cast. This is the idea of of, of throwing a, a blanket on an animal. If you're if you're riding, uh, you put a blanket on the horse and then you put the saddle on. It's this throwing. So you still have it. It's still yours, but you're you're letting go of it at the same time. Because you, you, it doesn't mean you forget about it entirely. You just let go of it. It's not like. You know, when you're fishing, this, this is what I do very often. When I'm fishing, I'm now on, by the way. I was not previously on, but now I am. Um, when you're fishing, and, you, and this, this, this is my thing, is, you know, with worry, you cast it out, but you reel it back in, right? And that's often what I do, is I'll cast something out. I'm giving this to the Lord. I'm not going to think about it anymore. I'm not going to worry. But I kind of reel, <laughs> kind of reel it back in over time. Sometimes I really, you know, I can really get it out there. But then I reel it back in. <laughs> and, and that's very often how I do it. And then, you know, even if you, you, along with a fishing metaphor, what if you just stick your pole in there and, so, and you walk away, but then you come back and check on it, right? And then you walk away and then you come back and check on it. That's, that's what I do. I'll, I'll worry periodically, sporadically. It's not all the time. It's not overwhelming. It, you know, I gave it to the Lord. Well, I, 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 I took it back. I just wanted to see how it was doing. It's probably a quotation from Psalm 55, which a lot of uh, the New Testament, including Jesus, quoted the Old Testament quite a bit. Psalm 55 says, Cast your burden on the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. In other words, he'll never... Permit the righteous to, to be shoved off balance. That's what being moved means in this context. So, let me read that again. Cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be shoved off balance. So let's... Okay. So how do we cast our burdens on the Lord? Well, by prayer. And, and when Paul says pray without ceasing, that's what he's talking about. Remember last, last week, I know one guy remembers last week, but if, if you remember last week, I, I read this passage where Paul is talking about all the terrible things that have happened to him. He's been beaten, you know, the 40 lashes save one three times, and uh, shipwrecked and beaten up and all these things and then the last thing he said was and I worry about you guys night and day you know it was, well he worried he worried for the church he worried for all these new believers that he was concerned about 
But he also said, pray without ceasing. So I, I'm imagining that he was constantly in prayer for those people who he had shared the gospel with all around uh, in the areas where he'd been a missionary to. And, and he was praying for them. Philippians 4, 6 and 7, which Paul wrote, The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. He was. So, you know, he's writing to himself in some sense, but he's also writing to the Philippians. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So the peace of God. So what, what, what's the, the outcome of prayer? It's peace. Even though you keep praying about the same issues over and over and over, you can still have a peace about it. You know, Alice Cooper had a peace about Glenn Campbell, about his eternal welfare. And yet they had a lot of hard times in their lives. And continuing, he, he, Glenn Campbell at the end of his life had Alzheimer's. So here's this poor guy who's still in the public eye and he was doing, you know, getting picked up for speeding and being drunk and so well, he has Alzheimer's. And, you know, a lot of times in the news they don't add those little tidbits that this guy's really sick and he's in bad shape. They just put a mug shot up of him. Um, it's kind of sad when you're in the public eye. You just kind of get creamed that way. You know? um, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. All of them. All of them? There's some of them that really aren't worth God's time, right? Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> God cares about all our needs. Do you think God doesn't care about your finances? I mean, what if you messed up your finances? Do you think God cares about that? I mean, God didn't mess up your finances. You're the one who messed them up, right? So you should take care of that and fix it by yourself. Well, we think that way. Some of us, maybe you don't, but I think that way sometimes. And, no, there isn't anything too small, really. You, do you tell a child, oh, you're, you're thing, the things that you're worried about aren't important. God doesn't care about those things. No. No, you tell a child, God cares about you, right? God cares about your life. God cares about the little things. If they're a big thing to you, they're important to him. Casting all your anxieties. See, all, all worry isn't sin. Paul was pretty comfortable as, as, as he's writing in uh, talking about the things he's worried about. Here in 1 Thessalonians 3.1, he says, Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, well, why could you bear it no longer? Because we were worried sick. <laughs> Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in your faith that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction, just as, just as it has come to pass, and just as you know. Same thing going on with, with Peter. He's talking about something's coming. Hard times are coming. Persecution's coming. Paul goes on, he says, For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, he said, he repeats himself. I just couldn't take it anymore. I, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you 
and their labor would be in vain. He was so worried that they were going to fall away from their walk with the Lord. It's a worrisome thing. Peter's talking about the same thing. John Calvin says, But we are not thus bidden to cast all our care on God as though God wished us to have strong hearts and to be void of feelings, but lest fear or anxiety should drive us to impatience. I had to read this about five times before I totally understood it because it uses this kind of archaic language. In other words, the reason God wants us to, to let go and let God is so we won't get impatient. Get impatient. You ever pray the same prayer like for years? And <sighs> I don't know why God's not listening. Uh, you know, all these things we tell ourselves about because it's, it's not time yet. Or maybe it's not God's will and we just won't let it go. We don't know. We're just told to pray and, and that's fine, but let it go. That's the hard part. And not let go of the prayer, let go of the response. You know, we, we get into this demanding things from God. Well, what about God's will? We can continue to demand all we want to. If it's not God's will, it's not going to happen. You can keep praying it. That's all right. Just don't make that demand. Just don't make the demand. Worry is kind of in the, in the, the fear constellation of, of uh, emotions. It's in the fear family. Worry is. Um, and it's really hard to conquer fear. What conquers fear? Perfect love. Perfect love casts out fear, doesn't conquer it. Casts it out, gets rid of it. Fear has this way of lingering back. You know, fear is kind of like, how, uh, how are you doing? I knew you, I know you threw me out, but... How are you doing? Just checking. Just concerned about you. Yeah. Psalm 56.3 says, When I am afraid, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God whose word I praise. In God I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? What can flesh do to me? Well, a lot, but ultimately, not so much. Glenn Campbell, he's in heaven. Lived a rough life. We didn't know it. We just saw him playing golf and having a golf tournament, his name, and on and on, and being popular and singing and extremely talented. We didn't know all of the literal hell that he was going through in his life. What can flesh do to me? First he experienced fear and then trust. Fear kind of pushed him over into trust. So in a sense, fear God uses fear because we need him. And just because you're concerned about something, it doesn't mean it has to control your life. Well, that's... God has broad shoulders. He wants us to lean on Him. I'm going to end there. And I'm going to finish this next time. I, I got about one quarter of the way through a sermon that I thought was going to be shorter. <laughs> I just have no sense of these things. Well, I, I, was, I was thinking... People 
people who prepare sermons are always looking for illustrations, you know, like the perfect illustration. One I was thinking about but didn't do was to bring like 20 suitcases out here and actually start the sermon late because I'm, I'm bringing suitcase after suitcase after suitcase in from my car maybe, you know, somewhere. Uh, and, and they're all labeled with things I worry about. And it would have been a great, wouldn't that have been great? You would have never forgotten it. I was just too lazy to do it. <laughs> no, what can I say? What can I say? <laughs> Let's just be honest here, right? Yeah, it would have been wonderful. I, and, and then every so often, I would have gone over to one of the suitcases and checked on it, right? Because isn't that what we do? We spend an awful lot of time. And then at the end of the sermon, I would have had to take more time to carry all this stuff off before I ended. And what a waste of time. But what a perfect illustration that would have been. A missed opportunity. Oh, well. But Peter says, cast your anxieties on him. You know, we're going to China. Big deal, right? I mean, they've never been to China. Well, we can bring one suitcase. And I got an email this week. One suitcase and a carry-on. You know, so it's like flying southwest, right? Uh, you, have to, you can bring more. You just have to pay for them. And who wants to do that? Spending, you know, thousands of dollars on a trip to China, but don't want to spend an extra 50 on a piece of luggage. I don't know. Anyway, I'm not spending that money. So, yeah, so it sends us this, this uh, send me this email and says, you know, bring the suitcase, but only fill it half full. Because you want to buy stuff there, right? Man, I guess I'll have to leave my worries here. Okay. <laughs> How am I going to do that for two weeks? That was the illustration I didn't use. God wants us to, to know and be reminded who we are. Who we are and where we're going. Who we are and where we're going. The last illustration. Albert Einstein, the name that we all know, right? He was, he, this is a true story. He, he was on a train, and um, this was when conductors came by and asked for your ticket. So he's on this train. The conductor comes by and asks for his ticket. Albert Einstein was very often distracted, you know, thinking of evidently some important stuff. So the conductor comes by and Einstein's like, he's looking for the ticket, right? He's looking all over and he can't find it. It's kind of embarrassing. And the conductor says, Dr. Einstein, um, I know who you are. I'm sure you bought a ticket. Don't worry about it. So the ticket agent continues, you know, down the down the stretch, and he's getting taken. And he looks back, and Einstein is on his on his knees, looking for his ticket. And and the and the and the agent says, "Don't worry about the ticket, Doctor Einstein. I know who you are." And Einstein calls back and says. Yeah, I know who I am too, but I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> well, God wants us to know who we are in Him, where we're going. Not to worry about that. You know, think of all the things we worry about, but the most important thing to worry about is how you're going to spend eternity. And Peter is saying, what God's saying to us is, you don't have to worry about that. What can flesh do to you? 
Don't worry about it. Dear Lord, I thank you that it seems like I pray this every week, but you promise never to leave us or forsake us. That you walk with us each step of the day. And, and, I, and I pray, Lord, that we would look to you, that we would constantly look to you, that we would constantly allow you to be our guide in this very hard world that we live in. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you're like a, a light shining in our path. Thank you for all these things. I pray for all of us as we go our separate ways today and as we, whether we're traveling or just traveling around, that you would keep us safe, that you would keep us alert, and that you would continue to bless us with our, the relationship that we have with you. In Jesus' name, amen.